Uh, I hope everybody's doing good today. Uh, I I love hanging out on Twitch and watch a lot of streams myself. So <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I I love uh, ch chatting with folks on Twitch. Um, and today, really, what I want to kind of share with you and and maybe even hopefully discuss in the Q Q and A is kind of what it looks like to contribute to quantum open source. So. Um, Here's my slide. Boop. Uh, yeah, so Nathan said a lot of this, but uh, I think the one thing that was new about me is uh, just a few weeks ago, I'm now a Python Software Foundation fellow. So uh, I'm really excited to be working with that community more, more broadly. But yeah, I've been working in quantum technology and kind of software development stuff for 12 years-ish now. <laughs> I started as an experimentalist and now uh, am kind of working in software and algorithms kind of and, and full stack. Uh, basically anything you can do on a computer. <laughs> um, so let's, let's get to the topic at hand. Uh, probably a lot of you know this, but just for full kind of clarity here, uh, open source or the open source community is Basically, when you have software that can be freely accessed or shared like or changed, um, that doesn't come without strings or conditions. So there's things like licenses, uh, processes and governance, uh, how these projects are funded. Um, and that's really all also a part of the open source ecosystem. Like I think a lot of us, including myself, usually just think of specifically the code itself. Um, but there are lots of things kind of around it that really make open source work. Um, and you can see like, <laughs> I, I am sure there's probably at least, I'm gonna go with like a hundred different open source tools I am using right now <laughs> to talk to you <laughs> from the browser to the streaming software that I'm using to composite webcam stuff. Like it's, it's pretty crazy how much we actually use uh, all the time. So, you know, obviously these resources are out there, but, uh, you know, say you are working in quantum technologies or you want to get into working in quantum technologies, you know, you probably want a job or to get into a academic program. Why would you want to contribute to open source? So there's kind of three good reasons. <laughs> uh, the first is that quantum technology is already almost entirely open source. So you know, from its very beginnings in the early 2000s, like we had a lot of the academic, uh, larger academic software code bases, open source, things like Q-tip. Um, and as we've kind of progressed, uh, really, I, I, I think it's really exciting that a lot of the different companies and universities and projects have kind of seen the value of not necessarily, of, of making what they're working on open because really, you know, <laughs> The whole point, at least I'm interested in quantum computing, is that we don't actually know how it's going to work yet. And so having all of these tools and resources and projects open source means everybody can contribute. Everybody can see and kind of smush them together <laughs> to make new things, um, which really overall helps the entire ecosystem. So, you know, I think it's as compared to some other kind of like cutting edge tech fields, I think how much quantum technologies have committed to open source in general is really pretty amazing. So basically the community is already here. <laughs> the second, uh, contributing to open source can really help build a lot of skills. So um, you can see here is a screenshot of my GitHub profile, but it gives you a good way, you know, like, Obviously, you can have a resume and a CV, you can have papers, but this is kind of another way to really showcase uh, your work and to help um, show people also kind of how you learn. They can kind of see when did you start like writing Python stuff and then what projects were you working on? Um, and you can also like say there's a project, you know, maybe you're using Q-tip or something for some homework, you can make a a contribution to Q-tip to make it work better for your homework <laughs> or to make it work better for the, the task you're working on at work. Like, you know, not only are you developing the skills of actually modifying the code, but how to kind of contribute to these projects. And it allows you to kind of explore more areas in quantum tech. Like one of the things that I think is really 
interesting to think about is like Nielsen, Nielsen and Chuang, the kind of uh, quantum information and computation, I think that's the title of the book, affectionately known as Mike and Ike, uh, that pretty much everybody treats as canon for quantum computing was over 20 years ago. And so that was kind of back when quantum computing could fit all in one book. <laughs> uh, we really could not do that at this point. And so like, you know, there's obviously lots of different kinds of textbooks, but software and, and open source pr projects are really something you can actually get hands on and work on without having to be in a program. And so you can kind of explore a bunch of different areas in a much smaller commitment sort of way. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, working in open source uh, can really create uh, career opportunities. So um, I think I'm a pretty good example of this, but uh, after, so I did a PhD, uh, an experimental PhD in uh, QKD, uh, satellite QKD stuff. I did a postdoc in Australia and I kind of wanted to try out working in industry. Um, and so like, I really didn't know how to make that transition very well. And uh, I started going to open source software meetups. So pretty much regardless of where you are, you will probably be able to find either in-person or virtual meetups for different open source technologies or programming languages. So like here in Seattle, I went to like PyLadies and um, R ladies, so Python and R are two different programming languages. And I started, like, I met a lot of people uh, who were doing this professionally, kind of found out what they were working on, followed them on Twitter. <laughs> like, seriously, the single biggest probably career advice I could give you right now is make a Twitter account and at least lurk. <laughs> uh, because there's a lot of, as I think some of the earlier um, speakers uh, at QHack mentioned, that there's a lot of quantum discourse on, on Twitter. Um, but yeah, it, it's a really great way to network with people, show people what you can do kind of to the portfolio point, but also industry is hiring. <laughs> like every, every, every company that I see, whether it's a startup, a big company, they are looking for people with software dev experience. Um, and with either, you know, Certainly there are some that will say also we want a PhD or we want a master's, but a lot of them don't because really the skills that we need and why I find right now working in quantum computing really exciting is because we don't have, you know, there isn't this giant hurdle that you have to go through X amount of school before you can contribute. <laughs> That's kind of what open source, quantum open source represents is this ability for anyone to actually make meaningful contributions to this field without having to go through um, go through academia. So yes, technically I did first, <laughs> but honestly, most of what I do right now does not touch <laughs> much of anything that I did during my PhD. And uh, yeah, so like after industry, uh, I I was just working in, in regular like product development engineering. Um, and I actually <laughs> found out about the company that I currently work at, Unitary Fund, and got a micro grant from them to start a quantum open source project. And that's basically <laughs> how I how I transitioned to kind of now doing actually quantum development full time. So what does it actually when I when I say and I've said it probably a bunch now uh, contributing to open source, what does that actually mean? Um, Probably the most obvious uh, is writing code. <laughs> and honestly, before I started, you know, I, I was programming for a long time during my, like during school and stuff, but I, like I knew about this GitHub thing and I knew about GitLab and I, but I was just like, no, my code is too bad. I don't want to show anyone. <laughs> so like, I just thought contributing to open source was sitting down, opening up notepad.exe or opening up <laughs> just some sort of text editor and writing code just straight from your brain. Uh, it turns out like none of those things are true. <laughs> so certainly code contributions are a large part of it, but they are absolutely not the only part. Um, and it, for myself and for a lot of people, I think 
the way folks actually get into open source projects and contributing is actually doing something from this list first <laughs> um, before going straight to code contributions. Obviously, that's not a requirement, but you know, if there's a project you're interested in, there's maintainers always need help. <laughs> so like as a maintainer, I can say I always appreciate help in like all of these categories. So like most I've highlighted a couple here that are kind of the most impactful, uh, but like writing and editing documentation, going through and helping organize or update issues, you know, maybe some have gone stale or haven't aren't relevant anymore, just closing those. Um, just setting up installing the project and like writing a blog post about that. <laughs> That's some some of my favorite, uh, honestly, because then that highlights things to the developers, like what did people have to go around or accommodate? But uh, yeah, there's if there's one thing you get out of this talk is you can, contributing to open source is more than just code. That's, that's the tweet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, there's, and, you know, I, other ones here I have are like pair programming with folks, you know, both so you can learn. And so sometimes like I get really stuck <laughs> writing code and it just helps. The The software developer term for this sometimes is called rubber ducking, but having someone sit next to you that you explain stuff to, and then, you know, it just kind of makes more sense and you figure out what you were stuck on. But uh, yeah, all of these are great ways to contribute to open source projects that are not code. So a couple other things to kind of just add some context around uh, what does it like. So we have this open source project. Presumably it's this some code sitting somewhere online, probably GitHub. Um, but projects also have people <laughs> like they are, in fact, the core part of the project. So, you know, you will have someone who probably owns the project. Um, you'll have maintainers who are people who regularly um, will check on issues, contribute code, communicate with everybody else. Um, there'll be contributors who are maybe adding features um, or helping out with any of the things on that list, but aren't necessarily responsible for <laughs> effectively gardening <laughs> or being, uh, you know, caretaking the rest of the, the repo. Um, and then there's also users. And, you know, obviously, whenever we make something, we we hope that people will use it. <laughs> and so a lot of what you can do as a main, there are lots of good resources to help you as a maintainer or a contributor to a project, help find support and encourage your users. Um, but, and you can see here, uh, I, um, the project at uh, Unitary Fund that I work on, Mythic, which uh, shout out one of my coworkers, Andrea Mari, will be giving a talk about later in QHack, uh, I think on Thursday. Um, so Mythic is an error mitigation library, but whenever we have people make contributions, we actually have a bot that adds them to the end of our readme. <laughs> um, and so you can see here, this is just a small snapshot of all of the people who have contributed to our project. And so um, it's really cool to see, you know, when folks who don't know you, don't know anything, you know, just kind of come out of the blue and are like, hey, I'd like to add this. And you're like, oh, yes, it's a great feeling as a maintainer. But yeah. Projects inherently have, oh yeah, there's Andrea Mari's in chat. Um, you should put in chat what time your talk is because I don't remember. Um, but yeah, so projects really, the community is a huge part of the project. Like the code isn't just it. <laughs> um, some other core pieces of a project is projects also have documentation. Like <laughs> um, if it, it is really hard, like if you're, you're open sourcing some code or a plugin or a, whatever you're working on, <laughs> could even be educational material. It is really important to have documentation um, to show people what this is. And there's some like really critical ones that you should always have. So first and foremostly, you should have a license. I know that sounds kind of legalistic, but that really governs what people, how people can interact with your code. So if you don't have a license file, uh, then people legally really can't use your code. So GitHub and GitLab and a lot of these tools have uh, 
a lot of good descriptions for what sort of license to pick. There's kind of some default ones like MIT that are just like, yeah, anybody can use this. That's great. Um, but certainly read the details about what each one of those means. Um, and there's a lot of good resources on uh, open source dot guide. Yes, <laughs> which is a, um, a website from GitHub that has a bunch of um, good resources here and where some of the material that I've got here comes from. Um, other important sort of files or documents uh, that you can uh, make sure that your project has or look for when you're uh, looking to uh, work on a project are things like the contributing guide and code of conduct. Those both basically describe how the community interacts with the project. Um, so especially if you're looking to contribute to a project, looking at the contributing file, which is usually at the root, um, or you can find it in the docs if, uh, if not. But that really kind of describes uh, the next part that we're going to talk about here, which is kind of the workflow of contributing to the project. Um, so also, side question, do you want me to take uh, questions while we're going here, or do you want me to wait? Uh, we will take the questions and get them back to you at the end of the talk. Thanks. I can't hear you, <laughs> but that's fine. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, when you contribute to an open source project, there usually will be some sort of contributing uh, file that will kind of describe just the basic process. Usually it's like file an issue, uh, make a pull request, we'll review it, and then we merge it. Like, And so it's there can be very, depending on the project, it can be very similar or very different. Sometimes it's impacted by people's uh, company policies, et cetera. Um, but that's why checking out their, their rules or their workflow is really important. But, um, you know, for example, I can show you on Mythic, so the repo for Mythic on GitHub, you can see we have a bunch of issues. Somebody would file an issue, then there's uh, you know, a tab for pull requests, and that's basically where they would make contribute the code or the documentation or whatever that uh, they would want to address the issue. Um, obviously, if what you're contributing is curating issues or uh, adding comments and stuff, don't have to make a pull request. But uh, And a lot of times, projects also have, like, say you have a question about using it, but it's not like an issue. It's not like a bug. Um, a lot of times projects will have um, some sort of forums or slacks or discords or Twitter handles. Like you could, you should be able to find from the projects readme uh, kind of how, how to ask questions of the developers and maintainers that isn't necessarily opening issues <laughs> unless it is, you know, relevant to something in the code. If it's just like, um, you know, I, I'm wondering if this works for my project or if this is, you know, this part, this package makes sense to do for X, Y, and Z. Um, yeah, find, finding those places you can ask questions informally uh, is really great. And you can also get to know the maintainers <laughs> because they are people, they are not robots who just randomly respond to issues. <laughs> um, community calls can also be a great way to get to know um, maintainers and how the work workflow of the project uh, goes. Um, I know Penny Lane has community calls on the Unitary Fund Discord. We do for Mythic as well, and a lot of other projects, um, both on the Unitary Fund Discord and otherwise, have these community calls, which are a great way to interact with folks and kind of do that networking piece. <laughs> um, so hopefully at this point, <laughs> I will have convinced you that contributing to open source is a good idea and how you uh, can get into it. So let's actually like go through um, what sort of steps or what you might need to do to do that. So um, kind of along what we were talking before, finding a community to kind of help support, uh, you know, when you have questions or, or just you don't even <laughs> know where to start on something. Uh, communities that are, you know, either specific to a project or specific, or just kind of more general. So um, there's uh, a kind of open community for QWorld. There's the Quantum Open Source Foundation. There's Unitary Fund. Um, like there's so many, I could not list them all here, but it's really groups like this uh, were kind of how I got into 
doing anything in open source. So I actually only made my first open source contribution four, two, five years ago, four or five years ago, whatever 2018 is. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't do math. Um, but it was basically because I had met some people at an open source uh, meetup group. You know, they they were a community of like it was the Azure Advocates. And someone literally sat down with me in person and was like, OK, you've got the code. Let's click here. Let's, you know, that error message. All right, that's OK. That's that's expected. Let's do this. And and really doing that sort of. Um, just having someone there to co-pilot with you can be really, really empowering. So regardless of what your skill level is, you know, maybe you make, you use Git all the time and you're using and contributing to open source more generally, and now you want to do quantum stuff, or if you've never heard of Git and never used it, <laughs> um, you know, having that community support can be really, really helpful. Um, so finding the right project, this is a really open-ended one, and there is so many different ways you could come onto this, but uh, or ways you could find stuff. Like there are pages that list kind of general sorts of um, projects that are looking for contributions. There's ways to look on GitHub for projects that have quantum computing listed as a topic or quantum information or quantum crypto like you just search at the top of github this is kind of what it looks like and it'll just show you repos um you can if you find a repo for a project or something like that you can also look if you're looking for something specific to get started on uh good first like issues can be tagged good first issue and those are always good places to start if you don't have something already in mind um and yeah, I think one of my favorite places to point people to for this, just to kind of like give a rough overview of most of what's out there, uh, is if you go to Q the Quantum Open Source Foundation, qosf.org, uh, I will try to put a link in chat here, but um, it's a, they have a really great page that has just like, <laughs> you can see scrolling through here, different libraries, simulators and stuff. And so based on whatever you're interested in, um just grab something or <laughs> sometimes i look at projects that are things that i think i abjectly would never want to work on just to like test that <laughs> because sometimes i've been really surprised by like just the description or what i thought about the project or what i thought about say i mean basically this was tensor networks i wasn't sure that i liked tensor networks or even understood how they worked but I looked at a open source simulator for Tensor Networks and I was like, oh, this is actually pretty nice. And so like code can also be a great way to learn new topics too, because it's a very concrete thing that's actually written down. It's not necessarily just reading math. Um, and if you can't find a project that interests you or that kind of meets your needs for your studies or for your work, you can start your own. <laughs> um, there are also lots of good resources uh, for, you know, kind of walking you through setting up a new project. Um, so one of them maintained by one of my coworkers uh, is a make your code count kind of walks you through for Python, what it would look like to kind of start an open source library from scratch. But if you, for whatever language or tool chain that you're working with, there are tons of good tutorials for how to do this. Um, so yeah, just, <laughs> I couldn't list them all here, but just Googling like a start, a, you know, new GitHub project and then like Rust or Julia. Um, but, and I'm just going to put a link here to open source guide. This is, this is a great for just general sorts of advice, uh, on working in open source. So whether you're starting a project, building your user base, things like that, I always go to that and look. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, mods, I didn't realize links were off. OK, um, so yeah, one uh, unitary fund where I work is basically here to support 
the quantum open source ecosystem. So especially if you're interested in starting your own project or contributing to projects, um, we really work to create a quantum technology ecosystem that benefits the most people. So how we do this is we give out micro grants to projects that, uh, so it's $4,000, no strings, uh, US, no strings attached to basically people who submit applications. We review them on a rolling basis, so there's no deadlines. And really we like to fund projects that, you know, kind of wouldn't have support or maybe are a little bit more risky than, you know, a something that maybe a company or a um, PhD program or something would support. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of what that looks like uh, in a sec. But the other thing that we do at Unitary Fund, as you can kind of guess from all the stuff about Mitic, is we also do our own research and development software, uh, research software development. We publish papers. Um, and we also work with existing open source projects to kind of help support them, whether it's with governance like Qtip or just kind of giving the maintainers advice on how to um, best grow their project. Um, so yeah, here are some examples of maybe of projects that we funded with the micro grants that are maybe what you might expect. <laughs> so things like, um, we funded Crack, uh, which is a GPU accelerated uh, simulator um, that in kind of certain areas can has really, really good performance. Um, QNET Sim, which is for simulating quantum uh, networking. So like networking different quantum devices together. Um, layout synthesis, uh, ALSQ. <laughs> I always think it says Oslo, but it's, it's not. Um, but yeah, so tons of projects like this where, you know, it's maybe for a specific part of your quantum software stack, like layout or simulation. Um, we work on Mitic, which is a um, error mitigating compiler in Python. So, you know, a lot of these probably are exactly what you would expect. <laughs> but a large part of the projects that we fund is also ones that are open education or open communities. So um, I mentioned in some of the community lists before, but like QWorld, Qubit by Qubit, Gate42, these are all groups that we've um, funded to kind of help build those communities that support the open source software and projects. Um, so, you know, we, we help them become nonprofits or we give them funding for, for programming. Um, and we also fund uh, kind of educational materials and curricula. So we've helped uh, folks develop a quantum algorithm, higher, higher level quantum algorithms course, a fairy tale book on uh, quantum, taking quantum algorithms and mashing them up with fairy tales. Uh, it's honestly one of my favorite <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, projects that we funded, uh, as well as, and then quantumalgorithms.org, which I've been to a lot lately, actually, um, because it's a great, it's a, what I call living textbook. So it's it's open source, it's all maintained um, by folks who are working in quantum algorithms. So as there's new information and stuff that comes out, it gets updated, but it's a really good resource if you're looking, you know, there's an algorithm that you wanna study uh, to just kind of in more plain words than just reading the <laughs> proof uh, or the theorems as stated in papers. It's a great resource. Um, so yeah, the, the application process uh, for micro grants for the Unitary Fund should take about, you record a two minute video, so that might take you more than two minutes, but the rest of it is like probably four-ish text boxes uh, and you know maybe a couple sentences each. So it really doesn't take too long. And we encourage like uh, when we reject applications, we usually try to give good feedback about how you could improve the application. So repeat applications are totally okay. But yeah, so uh, basically to kind of sum stuff up here, uh, communities of people are really what is making quantum technology work. Um, and it's really important that we make those communities open, welcoming, and safe for everyone to contribute. Um, so uh, my pupper Chewy here <laughs> is staring into your soul, wanting you to make you make a contribution to quantum technology today. 
<laughs> uh, he he likes taking over my laptop when I'm trying to sit and work at the table. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can, um, if you have any questions about any of this, you want to know more or you have questions about things, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm on Twitter and DMs are open. Um, probably the best way to get feedback, not only from me, but also from the broader quantum open source community is to check out our Discord. So that's discord.unitary.fund. Um, we have like probably close on 2000 people there now that are kind of actively answering questions. There's maintainers for all these projects there. So if you wanna to talk to them directly um, and you can also shoot me an email or check out the Unitary Fund website. But uh, I really hope, <laughs> I hope this has been encouraging and really can kind of help show you that you don't have to just sit and write code by yourself to get started contributing to open source. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was, uh, I must say, the most beautiful talk we had today. Some really, really sharp slides there. I do have to ask you about Chewy. How many, how many open source repos has Chewy contributed to? Um, well, there is one specifically. Uh, he would hang out with me. Uh, I used to, I, I sometimes do uh, live programming on Twitch. So I've especially on the micro grant that I got from Unitary Fund, I literally live streamed almost the whole thing. <laughs> so me learning the programming language, learning how to, to write the library. Um, and I had a separate cam on <laughs> Twitch that was the dog cam. The Chewy and cam. so people, people in chat could tell, say, hey, Chewy needs a treat right now. <laughs> so he didn't really contribute to code, but he contributed to entertainment. <laughs> was, was there a Chewy emoji? Yes, there actually is. Um, oh, amazing. Can I, let's see if I can put them in oh, chat. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, if that'll show up in chat. There's, there's people crying out for Chewy. They want it, They want to see that emoji. Yes, yes. <laughs> I got a whole custom emoji set made. So Amazing. There's Amazing. also a bunch on, on my Discord too. That's, that's how you know that Sarah is a Twitch veteran. She's got the custom <laughs> emoji game. Uh, awesome. Sarah, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, kind of... The way I see it is like open source started as a software principle, but it seems to like be growing beyond that. Like now you can start thinking about, you know, how do we do science or how community building in an open source way? I'm just curious if you have any more thoughts about that. Yeah, I think, you know, there is a particular philosophy to how, you know, that started from the software piece of it that I think I have personally learned a lot from and taken a lot of inspiration from when I go and approach, uh, you know, broader community building or educational sorts of um, activities. <laughs> I mean, the whole reason I ended up writing the the textbook that I did uh, was because I was, you don't have to have a degree to contribute to quantum technologies. And I was just really frustrated that, you know, whenever people ask for advice or, uh, or you know, saw answers on the internet, it was always like, go get in a degree program, go get your whatever, you got to study quantum physics. And it's like, I don't think I touch anything in quantum physics really at this point on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, unless I'm literally reading a paper. And so like, you know, what I saw from these open source communities was just kind of taking, taking education, ga educational gaps like that into their own hands and creating the resources, you know, kind of like that quantum algorithms uh, textbook uh, that I mentioned. But yeah, like we don't have to be necessarily beholden to these specific formulas or specific paths. And so, you know, really, it's kind of freeing to both know that you can, you don't have to meet those molds. And you also, um, you know, another big piece of it for me is the kind of inclusivity aspects, like as a bi woman in, in uh, academia, I really did not feel welcome. I had a lot of harassment and discrimination, and that's mostly why I left. <laughs> I wanted to be treated respectfully, and so the open source community was amazing for that. Like I walked up, and from day one, they're like, "You are a, you are an equal contributor here," and you know, it's this is a democratic process, and so you know that. That sort of aspect of it to me was really, really kind of refreshing. And, you know, that's kind of part of what I try to bring both to Unitary Fund and, you know, other events and things that I run. 
Cool. Maybe continuing on this same line, you, you mentioned that you only started getting into open source, you know, I think it was three and a half years ago, if it was 2018, uh, 2019, <laughs> yeah. something like that. So, you know, you've, you've kind of pivoted your career a couple of times, changed focus, um, but still, you know, doing great and where you are right now. So I'm curious for other people who might find themselves in a similar situation, any kind of experience you can, you know, pass on some advice or lessons learned? Yeah, I think, you know, when I, I started doing physics stuff, uh, like kind of a little bit before undergrad and like I had this whole plan for my life, which was, this is great. I'm going to get physics degrees all the way to PhD. I'm going to be a professor somewhere. I'm going to have an office here crammed full of stuff from the fifties. Um, that's a fire hazard like that. That was the plan. <laughs> um, and you know, as, as I kind of progressed through that, like I actually didn't pass the GREs the first time I took them and it was like the last slot. So I actually couldn't get into grad school right after undergrad. And so like, you know, kind of rather, I, I worked in actually, uh, I was a software developer at Mathematica for a little bit, um, did that for a year and then went back to grad school. And, you know, I, I ended up having a much more wandering path than I think I originally intended. And, you know, kind of how I view it now is I actually learned a lot from every one of these kind of like slight detours or sidesteps or, um, you know, that they add a lot of flavor effectively to what I know. And I think that sort of kind of breadth to what you, to your skill set is actually really helpful. <laughs> you know, there was, I, I always had in my head this kind of romantic view of the pure solo academic who sits and writes papers and stuff like that, or aligns stuff in the lab all the time. But they're honestly not usually the biggest contributors necessarily to what they're working on because they're not working with the community. <laughs> like we don't do science here in isolation. <laughs> um, and so, you know, having those skills to work with the community, having those skills to kind of collaborate is really, really important. And I think that's kind of one of the biggest things, you know, also dipping outside of quantum tech and seeing how like general technology and stuff works. Uh, I really re learned a lot about best practice from that because uh, you know, sometimes in at least my physics education, we did not really have any programming course. We had one Fortran course and uh, I have not heard of anyone doing anything in Fortran. <laughs> not in lately, quantum. no. Not lately, you know, maybe if it was the 60s or 70s, uh, maybe QHack time, time frame, <laughs> uh, but uh, like the, the retro theme. But um, yeah, like there was a lot of gaps in the traditional education that you know, I think having some of these other opportunities really helped fill in. And I'm really grateful for it at this point. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sarah, I, I want to pivot here because I've heard you had some really amazing lab stories. Could you could you maybe share some of your antics, your hijinks from your <laughs> lab days? Yeah. Um, so I, I worked in quantum optics stuff. So that's a lot of lasers, aligning things. Um, in the dark, like I'm, I'm pretty much a vampire still. Uh, but yeah, so one of them I could mention was I worked with some pretty high powered lasers that we needed to couple into fiber, uh, but they're invisible. So that's like super fun to try in a line, <laughs> but you know, they made the air around, like, even though they're invisible, you could kind of put your hand close and you could feel the air being warm. That's how much like power we were talking about. Just don't put your um, eye close. Was, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, um. So it would have been 15, 50 nanometers at about 70 watts, but um, continuous. But I was trying to figure out when components broke. So this was like in some ways expected, but turns out you can start plasma fires in glass <laughs> with that much power, wow. uh, which are really fascinating because uh, they actually travel back towards the laser. Like I was really, really worried for a second because I was like, you know, if, if light's going through a fiber this way, and you something starts you expect it to kind of like keep going the same way but then like i panicked and like was trying to s run and smash all the like safety off things Yikes. <laughs> not that not realizing that it really because it goes to an air gap wouldn't hurt anything 
Um, we also had literally one of our control PCs start on fire because it was from two, uh, 1993. Um, we Running had Fortran, police. probably. <laughs> probably. Um, the postdoc before me had an entire cabinet full of components for these really, really old, like just past maybe like Windows 95 machines because a lot of our lab equipment only ran on that operating system. That's actually how I got into programming was because I needed to reverse <laughs> engineer these interfaces. And so I used Python to do that. Um, we also had uh, the police come to our lab once because some of our computers were doing illegal financial transactions <laughs> because uh, one of the uh, students in the lab didn't know about uh, Windows XP and the internet and decided to plug in the Windows XP machine, Service Pack Zero into the public internet and uh, wow. it was basically instantly compromised. So thankfully the Australian cops were pretty understanding. They're like, we realized you probably didn't mean to do this, but like, don't do it again. <laughs> wow. You didn't disappoint with those lab stories. Those are hilarious. <laughs> All right, Sarah, we are getting lots of questions in the chat. I know you're keen to, to hear from them. So why don't I pull a few mm -hmm. out uh, from the chat? So how about we start with uh, this one? What was your first contribution to open source and what did you find to be most or more difficult as a beginner? Yeah, so I think I shared uh, on the slide, I actually had the the tweet that I made when I did it, but I added a, um, the first code one was that one, which is I actually added a new like uh, operation to a Q Sharp library. Um, I probably comment, I definitely filed and commented on issues long before that, but I think at the time I didn't realize that those were also contributions, but probably those ones would have been like, I was working on reverse engineering these hardware drivers. And so they would have been commenting on some of these packages. Like I can't get the serial headers to work, <laughs> please, please help. <laughs> um, but, uh, so the other part of the question was one things that were challenging as a beginner. Um, yep. As a beginner, I definitely found Git at the beginning and, and kind of the workflows there a little bit challenging, um, mainly just because we don't, I didn't have any context for it in, in physics. We never really had any, as I mentioned, not a lot of education around <laughs> software dev practices. Um, so it was helpful to like have other people around me who knew these kind of walk me through um there are tons of on good online resources for sure just google like how to get how to use git um github also has a lot of good resources for that but um honestly now it's yeah it's it's like second nature and it's really basically the same as like you know using dropbox or something like that but just way more powerful because <laughs> yeah. it's version control so basically learning version control will be the short version I, I can second that. Uh, Git is definitely one of those things that's very intimidating the first time you see it, but once you once you grok it, it's like, okay, why didn't we ever? Why why do we not do this all the time? Like this makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's get some more questions out for you. Are there any resources besides GitHub and GitLab to contribute to ongoing open source projects that you can recommend? Um, Bitbucket, I know, is another like so. GitHub and GitLab are basically cloud hosted um, repositories that people can kind of all uh, connect to and share from. So those are those are nice because you can also then browse projects that are on there. <laughs> um, some companies and projects will actually host their own Git because there's no no reason that anyone else you can from your own computer host your own <laughs> git instance uh so you know sometimes you can find stuff like that but that's not it doesn't really help you discover new projects but yeah i think the three main kind of cloud or, or commonly used third-party services are github gitlab and, and bitbucket um and each of them has some pretty good like discoverability things like searching for different tags or topics for sure. And, and if you're looking for quantum open source projects, I know the Unitary Fund Discord has a lot of maintainers mm -hmm. and developers on there for many projects. Yeah. So if there's something specific you're looking for, just <laughs> drop a comment and uh, people can usually point you to some. All right. Next question. We've got uh, a question from Ankita Chat Ravarti. Uh, it said, made a Twitter account just now to follow quantum. Any suggestions on where to start? Ooh, 
Um, <laughs> so, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, any any companies or software projects that you like, like I know uh, Xanadu and Penny Lane has some good <laughs> accounts. <laughs> um, Unitary Fund, Quantum Open Source Foundation. Um, in terms of people, uh, I do usually appreciate Dave Bacon's uh, commentary. So he's at Google, but has been in the, the field a long time and is kind of known as a shit poster. So <laughs> he, he has great, great uh, comments, let's just say. And you're forgetting yourself, of course. Of course, we should oh, all yeah, follow Oh, yeah, also Sarah. me. Sorry. <laughs> that was maybe assumed on my side, but yes. <laughs> all right. Next question. It's a question from, uh, looks like Ivan K. Singe says, I'm curious about your views on commercial things. Would you recommend some projects to be open source and some to be commercial or 100% open source? Is it basically, should we go 100% open source or is there room for uh, non open source projects? So I would say that there's entirely room for non-open source projects. Like, obviously, in some sort of ideal world, everything is open source, but then there's no business around it. So I also understand <laughs> there are practical needs to support an industry that require, uh, you know, have, making businesses and stuff. Uh, and I think the the a really great way to do that is if you do have a closed source project document extremely well your interfaces or APIs. So like, you know, one of the things I generally like about open source is if I something's not working or the, you know, and I can't find documentation, I go and look at the source code. Um, and when I can't do that on a closed source project, I kind of by definition need better documentation then. So like people working on closed source uh, software things is totally fine. Just make it easy for me as a user <laughs> to do what I need to do with it or to interact or, or interoperate with. Um, and then like, that's totally fine. I mean, that's often how like lab software control and stuff is, except it's not documented well. So <laughs> please, please document it well. <laughs> you heard it here. Shit. All right, we got one more here from Antonio Jesus G. It says, how can we protect our open source project from being plagiarized uh, for commercial purposes? So probably the best tool you have on there is, uh, or to that, uh, to address that is licensing. So um, I definitely encourage, I, I'm not an expert, <laughs> I'm not a legal, I'm not a, a lawyer, um, but there are a lot of different types of licenses that you can open source your code under. Um, and there are some that basically prohibit commercial use. And so like, I mean, obviously you can't necessarily prevent someone from doing something illegal, <laughs> but you know, having the right licensing, you know, whether it's you allow commercial reuse, but with permission or attribution or it, it, like there, there's tons of different knobs you can kind of turn in terms of what you want to allow people to do or what you don't want to allow people to do and what whether you want attribution. So definitely read up on those sorts of things. But yeah, that's really, those are kind of really your best options. And, and you can have open, you can have multiple licenses for an open source project too. So that's often how open source projects can be funded. <laughs> so there'll be a version of the open source project that has, you know, maybe MIT license or something like that. And then you can sell a license to a company or something that wants to use it uh, in a different way. And so that's a, that's a common workflow. It's interesting. I, I remember one time we had a, a paper that we put on the archive and we shared all the code and we had a nice license there and, and someone plagiarized it and they just went and deleted the license file and somehow that made it okay to have, have copied our stuff and pass it off on their own. So play nice out yeah. there, everyone. Yeah. It's, it's other people working hard. They're providing things for free. So let's all let's all support each other. Yeah. And like always attribute, even if they don't require it. Like it's it's kind of like the right right thing to do. So awesome. Sarah, just one last question I have for you. Uh it's about Unitary Fund. So what role do you see uh, organizations like Unitary Fund, especially early on in quantum computing? 
those particular kind of organizations, how can they help actually get us closer to quantum computers? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think Unitary Fund and opens the open source community more broadly is like the the linchpin or the keystone to what actually makes the quantum technology the whole industry work because you know as most of the rest of the industry is you know commercial entities research entities which each have their own incentive structures like researchers want papers companies want investors or customers and you know it's kind of it's it's always hard to kind of get people to work together when their incentive structures are different. <laughs> and so open source kind of, uh, and the open source community more generally, because they kind of don't have either of those constraints or incentive structures, uh, kind of makes for a good glue between all of these different groups with different incentive structures to actually <laughs> kind of orchestrate them together uh, in like a, forward progression. So, you know, companies uh, all the time that do for profit things take dependencies on open source projects, uh, academics contribute new techniques and features to open source projects. So it's it's kind of like a, a great interface that really helps drive us forward. And it's also a place where you can be more risky. So like those incentive structures um, generally at this point don't allow for like really risky choices. Like you know, doing something that's totally out of left field. Like sometimes you have some leeway, but you know, in the end you need the papers, you need the citations, you need the the metrics or whatever. And open source is just like, yeah, we can we can try that. Whatever. <laughs> and so, you know, that's that's where like why the Unitary Fund does these micro grants to kind of help support the folks doing those really interesting out there, strange, not strange bad, but just strange in the not supported in other ways. So um, I think basically we have to kind of help spread the garden, <laughs> grow the garden that then everybody can kind of uh, harvest things from. I don't know, <laughs> I'm bad at analogies right now. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Thanks, Sarah. We look forward to lots of uh, amazing contributions to the field from the Unitary Fund and from the wider open source community. Thanks a lot for joining us here today. It was really great to have this very unique talk. Uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And uh, come hang out on the Unitary Fund Discord. <laughs>